Hi, welcome to the Poisson distribution, derivation. In this lecture, we're going to derive the Poisson distribution, shown in two forms here. So Poisson statistics are important for describing a wide range of phenomena, both in science and in everyday life. For an overview of where the Poisson distribution shows up, you might want to watch why the Poisson distribution is important. It's everywhere on this channel. Poisson statistics describe situations where an event occurs randomly, but has a constant probability of happening per unit time. We'll denote this probability of occurring per unit time as R. For example, an event may occur on average five times per year, in which case R would be five divided by a year, or 32.3 times per second. So R would be 32.3 over seconds. Now, given R, we could ask for the probability that this event occurs m times in some time span t. For example, let's say some event occurs on average 5.2 times per year. So R is 5.2 over a year. We can ask for the probability that in a given year, or in some other unit of time, the event happens zero times, happens once, happens twice, etc. And the answer to this question is the Poisson distribution. Now, there is a bit of math that you'll need for this lecture. So first, you're going to need to know what a factorial is. So a factorial is written as n with an exclamation point after it, and it's equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1. Second, we'll be using the result for something called n choose m, which is written as an n and an m in parentheses, and it's equal to n factorial divided by m factorial divided by n minus m factorial. Now, if you have n distinguishable objects, n choose m is the number of distinct subsets of m objects you can choose out of the n if you pay no attention to the order in which you choose the objects. If these concepts or the n factorial or n choose m notation is unfamiliar to you, you might want to watch the video a tiny bit of combinatorics on this channel before proceeding. There are also two other pieces of math that it would be good if you know going into this lecture. First, it would be useful if you know that 1 plus a over n, all raised to the n power, goes to e to the a in the limit that n goes to infinity where here e is the base of the natural logarithm, which is about 2.718. Also, we will be using Stirling's approximation for large factorials, and we'll give that approximation, but we won't prove it. So you might want to take a glance at that as well. Okay, so with that, let's get started. So let's say that a certain event happens randomly, but has a constant probability of happening per unit time, which we call r. We take the times when the event occurs as completely independent or uncorrelated. So the probability of it occurring in a given time span of length t is unaffected by how much time has elapsed since the last time the event occurred or how often it has happened in the recent past. So here's the question. Given the rate r and a time interval t, what is the probability, which we're going to call p of m, given r and t, that the event will occur m times in the interval t, where here m can be 0, 1, 2, etc. Okay, so the probability per unit time of the event occurring is r, and what this means is that for a very short time delta t, the probability of the event occurring is r times delta t. And by very short time, we mean that delta t is sufficiently short such that the probability of the event occurring more than once during the time delta t is negligibly small. Now, to see what happens in a not necessarily short time interval t, we will divide it into many very short time intervals. Okay, so let's represent our interval t by a line going from 0 to t. Now, let's subdivide it into n subintervals, each of length t over n. So we will take n to be very large, so that each of these subintervals of time t over n is very short. 
we'll take n to be sufficiently large that the probability for an event to occur in any given subinterval of length t over n is rather small. And more importantly, we take the probability for more than one event to occur in a subinterval of length t over n to be negligibly small. Eventually, at the end, we're going to take the limit of n goes to infinity. So we assume that every subinterval of length t over n has either zero events or one event occurring in it. We said before that the probability of an event occurring in a short time interval delta t is p equals r times delta t. So each of these subintervals has a probability of p equals r t over n of having an event occur in it. This also means that each subinterval has a probability of 1 minus p, which is equal to 1 minus rt over n, of having an event not occur in it. So we want the probability p of m, given r and t, of m events occurring in the total time interval t. So the probability p of m events occurring in the time interval t is the same as the probability that m subintervals each contain an event and n minus m of them do not. So let's find the probability for exactly m subintervals to contain events. Okay, so let's take a specific sequence of n subintervals where m of them each contain an event and n minus m of them do not. So, for example, if m equals 3, we could have one occurrence of the event in each of the three subintervals shown here. Okay, so each subinterval is independent of all of the others. So for each subinterval which contains an event, we get a factor of p, which equals rt over n, and for each subinterval which does not contain an event, we get a factor of 1 minus p, so that equals 1 minus rt over n. So we get the product here, where we have m factors of rt over n and n minus m factors of 1 minus rt over n. So this is the probability of one given sequence where an event occurs in m subintervals and does not occur in the remaining n minus m subintervals. Now, there are multiple sequences with m subintervals containing events and n minus m containing no events. The number of these sequences is n choose m, so n factorial divided by m factorial, n minus m factorial. So putting all of that together, the probability for m subintervals to contain events and n minus m not to is p of m given rt, and it contains m factors of the probability for a given subinterval to contain an event, so that means rt over n to the m power, and then n minus m factors of the probability for a given subinterval to not contain an event, so that's 1 minus rt over n, times n choose m, which is n factorial over m factorial, n minus m factorial. Okay, so this expression still contains n, which is our arbitrary number of subdivisions, and we're interested in the limit where n goes to infinity. So let's take our expression for p of m given r and t, which is again shown here. And first of all, let's look at the last factor in the expression. So the terms n factorial over n minus m factorial. So we're going to simplify this using Stirling's approximation, which is useful for factorials of large numbers. So here, n factorial is equal to the square root of 2 pi n times n over e to the n power plus terms that are of order 1 over n. So we're going to apply this to the n factorial and the n minus m factorial that we have in our expression for p, and we're going to drop the terms that go as 1 over n. So it's important to note that m is not necessarily large, and in fact we do assume that m is much less than n, so we do not take the limit m goes to infinity. Okay, so here we've applied Stirling's approximation to n factorial and to n minus m factorial. Now we're interested in 
n factorial over n minus m factorial. So let's see how that works out. So first of all, in both n factorial and n minus m factorial, there's a square root. Now, the square roots of 2 pi are going to cancel out and leave us with a square root of n over n minus m. Next, on top, we're going to get a factor of n to the n from n factorial, and on the bottom, we're going to get a factor of n minus m to the n minus m power from the n minus m factorial. And lastly, we have several factors of e. So from n factorial, we get an e to the minus n, and from n minus m factorial on the bottom, we get e to the n minus m. Okay, so let's make a couple of quick simplifications to this expression. First of all, let's look at that exponential at the end. Here, the minus n and the plus n will cancel out, leaving us with just e to the minus m. Second of all, let's look at that factor in the denominator of n minus m to the n minus m power. So this will simplify if we separate this into two factors of n minus m to the n power and n minus m to the minus m power. So in this expression, we've now installed those two simplifications. You might want to pause the video and make sure you understand what's happened. Okay, so on the previous slide, we derived this approximate expression for n factorial divided by n minus m factorial. Now let's simplify this in a couple of different ways. First of all, let's look at that factor in the middle of the expression, n over n minus m all raised to the n power. Now, we're interested in the case where n gets large, and you might look at the n over n minus m in this expression and say, well, doesn't that just go to 1? So n over n minus m is just equal to 1 over 1 minus m over n, and n is getting large, so it looks like this just goes to 1. However, it's raised to a very large power, and in fact, this goes to e to the m as n goes to infinity. And that's going to cancel out that factor of e to the minus m at the end of the expression. Second, using the fact that the square root of n over n minus m goes to 1, and n minus m to the m goes to n to the m for n much greater than m, we get that n factorial over n minus m factorial is approximately equal to the square root of n over n minus m times n minus m to the m power. And that simplifies down to approximately n to the m. Okay, so we're finally ready to put this back into our expression for p. Okay, so here we had our expression for p, and at the end we have these factors of n factorial over n minus m factorial. We're going to now substitute in n to the m. Okay, so now we have this expression for p. rt over n to the m, 1 minus rt over n to the n minus m, n to the m all over m factorial. Now, you might notice that there are two factors of n to the m that cancel out, so we can get rid of those, and then we can rearrange the factors a little bit to get p of m, given rt, is approximately equal to rt to the m over m factorial, 1 minus rt over n, all to the n power, 1 minus rt over n to the minus m power. Now, we note that 1 minus rt over n, all to the n power, goes to e to the minus rt as n goes to infinity. And lastly, the last factor goes to 1 for large n. So our expression for p simplifies down to rt to the m over m factorial times e to the minus rt for large n. Now we've done a lot of manipulations on the last few slides, so you might want to pause the video and review what we've done or make sure that you can reproduce the results yourself. Okay, so we have at this point obtained the Poisson distribution. But we are going to do one more thing to this expression. So if we go back to our derivation, each of the n subintervals had a probability p, which was rt over n, of having an event occur in it. There are n of these subintervals, and they are independent. So 
we expect on average that the event will occur in p times n, which equals rt over n times n, which equals rt of them. So the average number of occurrences of an event in time t is p times n, which equals rt. And actually, we could have started this derivation by defining r as the average rate of the event occurring instead of its probability per unit time. Now, let's denote this average number of occurrences expected in time t by lambda. So lambda is equal to rt. Then we can rewrite p of m given rt as p of m given lambda. And that's equal to lambda to the m over m factorial e to the minus lambda. So the Poisson distribution shows up in a wide variety of contexts, both in science and in everyday life. In this lecture, we have derived two versions of the Poisson distribution, p of m given r and t, or p of m given lambda. And depending on the circumstances, one of these versions may be more useful than the other. I should mention, finally, that in the case of large lambda, the Poisson distribution approaches another distribution that you might have heard of, called the Gaussian or normal distribution. This distribution also shows up in a wide variety of contexts, and we'll explore this in other videos.